Welcome, everyone, um, to Awaken Talks. Uh, the purpose of these calls is to hold conversations and explore ideas at the intersection of social change and inner transformation. Uh, we have a very special guest today that many people are very excited about. Uh, his name is Venkat Krishnan. Um, the hour is slated to be an open-ended conversation. Uh, Venkat and I are, have been friends for a long time and explored similar ideas for a while as well. Um, but at any point uh, in, in between our conversation, if you have comments or questions, uh, you just have to hit the, you know, submit the form on the live stream page, or you can always email uh, ask, it's ASK at servicespace.org. Uh, we have an entire crew of very inspired volunteers, um, and uh, they're going to try to make sure that we're in harmony with the technology gods, because, you know, uh, you never know how this is going to go. Um, before we get started, though, uh, we want to uh, we want to anchor ourselves in a minute of silence, as we always do. So, um, just just a, just a minute of silence before I introduce Venkat and we get into our conversation. Thank you, thank you again. Um, my name is Nipun Mehta, and today I'm delighted to moderate a conversation with a dear friend and an inspiration, Venkat Krishnan. Uh, Venkat, I think as most of you have, uh, know, he's, he's uh, most known as a founder of Give India that has facilitated crores of rupees uh, worth of doma donations for the NGO sector. He's also pioneered very mass movements uh, like the Mumbai Marathon and Dan Utsav, uh, also known as Good Joy of Giving Week in its early days. Um, and it's really been to inspire uh, generosity, whether it's through money or time. Uh, his work has directly, or I would say his work has impacted directly or indirectly uh, millions of lives. Um, he is a hero to the entire nonprofit sector in India. Um, and he doesn't much care if you know his name, um, but what he does care about is that you engage uh, with the values uh, and the work that he has initiated. Uh, he's the kind of guy, he'll donate blood, he'll take the rickshaw over a cab, he'll eat at home and save the money so he can give it to others who are in need. Uh, in his early years, I, I, I don't know if this is true, Venkat, still, but uh, in his early years, uh, he was known to live out of just two, two bags. Um, he's a simple person. Um, and yet what uh, is perhaps most impressive uh, for me, having known him for a couple of decades now, uh, is the longevity of service. He's been at this for a long time now, in one way, shape, or form. Um, and given his credentials, he could have done anything, but he's choosing to do uh, this uh, really remarkable uh, work with an untiring mind. Um, so it, it's a real joy and an honor uh, to know Venkat and to have him in this conversation. Um, and, and I should add, before I get to the first question here, of, of the infamous story, which I was just reminded of because we, we just got a comment uh, from, from Jayeshvai in Singapore. Um, and I, I think the first time Venkat and I really got to know each other, maybe we met once before, I don't know, but um, this, was a, this was close to 20 years ago, maybe. Um, both of us were invited to speak to this very influential group of trustees of a nonprofit. I think Jaya Bachchan was like one of their trustees and, and we were both going from Mumbai to Mathiran and so we're like, let's carpool. And so we're sitting in a cab together uh, and we really started chatting and, and I think that was the first deep conversation we had. Um, and I think what we figured out, and, and that's always been the case uh, uh, since then, I think what we figured out is Venkat was an outcome guy and I was a process guy. At least that's how everybody put it. And now that we've spent many years doing this, I think both of us would say that, of course, it's not either or, right? It's a yes and. Um, you need the process to get to good outcomes and you need the outcomes to make sure you're following the right process. Um, but we've always had this, uh, we've always teased each other about it over the years. And my claim to fame, my claim to fame, Venkat, this is true. I say that, look, Venkat is willing to give me and have an agenda-less meeting with me. So I, I, don't, I don't think he has that with too many people, but I'm delighted that we have these no reason conversations. And Venkat, I'm delighted to welcome you to another um, agenda-less conversation. Thank you uh, for, for joining and, and, 
and being here and for your lifelong work. Hey, thanks, Nipun. Uh, I'm wondering whether you are actually using a virtual screen because I can't see the halo around your head. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so, so Venkat, before before we start firing uh, each other uh, with questions, uh, I I wanna I wanna lead off with a question, um, and and the question is really about the current state of the world uh, that we're in, um, and you know we are in the pandemic, we're in a lockdown, its effects are disproportionately distributed, um, and. Uh, I, I think I want to start there and say and ask you that this is clearly a game changer, but which game is it changing and which direction is the change going in? And I think there's a lot of question marks around that. Um, you're tuned in to so many uh, data points on the ground uh, as well as at the systems level. So from your lens of India, uh, what do you see? Um, what are the challenges, but also like where do you think there are uh, opportunities. How's that for a, a nice to see you, Venka? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, no, I, you know, I think the impact is at so many different levels and in so many different areas that uh, I'll try and stick to the areas that we know a little more about. Uh, I think on the downside, the big impact is how many millions of people it's going to push back into poverty in a country like India. You know, in one fell swoop, I think no government policy had the capability of causing as much harm as this one pandemic has. I, uh, estimates vary between, you know, 100 to 300 million people getting pushed back into poverty, which is roughly eight years of work of, you know, good work that it takes to bring that many people out of poverty are going to go back. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, one step forward, but eight steps back kind of a thing. So that's one big 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 challenge uh, i think that you see here uh, but uh, also on the positive side if you ask me uh, and you know every time there is a large scale natural disaster you can always see human generosity coming forward uh, i've seen that you know in the last 20 years through various earthquakes cyclones floods and other disasters and i in fact have a almost a cynical joke that, uh, you know, every time there's a disaster, the nonprofits will thrive kind of a thing because there's huge outpouring of generosity and willingness. But I think this time it's been a lot more different than it is in a traditional mm -hmm. disaster in the mm -hmm. sense that the generosity has not just been with people going out and giving money, uh, which they always do during every disaster. But I think in an unprecedented way, people have actually volunteered time this time. And uh, I mean, just the sheer large number of communities and groups of people going out on the streets and doing their own bit and forming their own groups and, you know, engaging in service to help or to ameliorate the suffering of people who have been impacted. I think that to me is really, really good. Uh, for the first time in decades, the average Indian middle class has looked at the people who make our lives possible. So whether it's a maid, a driver, a you know, security guard, etc. Uh, for the first time, they looked at them, I would think, at a scale uh, as human beings, as opposed to just, you know, service providers. Uh, many, many, many people have had the sense to continue paying their maids, drivers and other people, even though they did not come to work over a long period of time. Uh, and of course, it's patchy, it's different in different parts of the country. But I think at an overall level, uh, we have flipped a certain momentum switch in terms of increasing the kindness and generosity in people. And I think uh, it's now incumbent on people like you and Yogesh and a bunch of others uh, to see how we can, and maybe I can play a small part in supporting you guys, how can we collectively use that momentum and not lose it? Uh, because if people are moving in the direction towards greater kindness and goodness, how do we celebrate that? How do we encourage that? And how do we let people stay on that path instead of, you know, regressing back to where they were earlier. Yeah, but this is a unique uh, disaster in that sense um, that there is no end line, right? Usually there's a disaster, there's a cyclone, there's an earthquake, there's a tsunami, and we, we, we can kind of see the end in sight. With this, mm -hmm. you almost cannot. 
And when you have that kind of a vacuum, you also see a lot of people who are in positions of power actually solidifying their power. So you see how like, you know, the, the big tech has actually just made trillions of dollars since the pandemic. Sure. Um, so their profits are actually skyrocketing. Uh, and e even in India, you have Geo getting unprecedented amount of investments. Um, so I, I'm also thinking from a systems level. I, I, I do yeah. see, I, I've also seen so much. I mean, we started a whole portal called Coronavirus um, mm -hmm. to highlight the stories of good. Uh, but I also am curious what you're seeing from the systemic lens. Um, mm. Is it uh, is it this? You're right. Power you're, yeah, I completely agree with you on this thing about solidifying of power. And you know, you can see that world over with politicians. I mean, we've yeah. seen at least a few countries declaring emergency. We've seen what uh. you know Bolsonaro and Trump have done there back here in India. Both at the national and the state government levels, we are seeing greater concentration of power with the authorities. So, you know, in India, for example, the National Disaster Management Act has been implemented. Uh, and it is, I mean, your authorities at all levels, whether it's at the central or at a state government or even a municipal corporation level, are able to use there is a pandemic as the reason to get away with, you know, the yeah. kind of travesties on civil liberties that you could otherwise never have seen. Yeah. And, and, and so how, how do you think that the bottom up upswelling of generosity in people's hearts, uh, how, how can it not get co-opted uh, by these kinds of uh, systemic levers? Like, what, what mm -hmm. is there a way? Because, I mean, of course, you do so much of this and you have done this, but particularly with Danutsov, where you have everybody giving, but what are they giving if the container uh, is actually, uh, you know, ha has uh, certain biases, then mm. that giving uh, actually has a very low ceiling, right, at some level. Like for e even, even, at a, even at a technological sort of metaphor, right, you share on Facebook and you feel like, oh, I'm connected to friends, but it's under the larger context of monetizing your conversations and your relationships. And so there's a real ceiling of what Facebook can do in terms of deepening mm. relationships. So in that same way, like what are the larger uh, systems that you feel, uh, I, I guess, what should be the relationship between the bottom up and the top down uh, to balance this out? Good question. And maybe you can answer it yourself as well. Uh, what's your perspective? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too, Nikon. Uh, I think there's two ways to look at it, right? One is that, uh, yes, you're right that, you know, these frameworks, the biases place a boundary on what kind of generosity can be practiced. Uh, you know, the only way you can break a boundary is when you get close to the boundary. Uh, so my way of looking at it is there are so many people who've been so content being in the center of the plot so far, they've never even ventured anywhere close to the boundary. And the good thing that's happening right now with this coronavirus that, as you call it, that's been spreading, is it at least getting people to venture out from that complete comfort zone into little spaces like that. And I think as people engage in more generosity, and as they encounter the blocks, which is where they hit the boundaries, they will gradually start changing. I think we have to give people opportunities to go and encounter the boundary as much as they can. And if more and more people encounter the boundary, then they will start questioning the boundary itself. So I think yeah. that's definitely one uh, way to look at it. Uh, the second is, I also think people are at different stages of evolution. So, you know, in the larger macrocosm of people, I mean, there are some people who are, like I said, always content being at the center. There were some people in the next circle outside. And we've always had the activists and champions who've always been on the boundary, banging against it, trying their best to push it. And so I think we will need to look towards those people and see how some of us can support those people to help break those boundaries as well. So I think it will have to be a combination of both of these. One is pushing as many people out to get closer to the boundary. And the second is to continue supporting the people at the edges who can help us you know, break the walls. Yeah. Um, and, and so just one follow up thought and a question maybe uh, before, you know, I want to get into some of your personal story as well, because that's uh, so inspiring. But, you know, this idea of breaking boundaries or reaching for them, um, there's so many ways to do that. 
Uh, and I think one of the things that I admire most, we both admire Gandhi, Vinoba, uh, is that they didn't really hate the enemy, right? They didn't think, they didn't create this, Correct. in trying to build one bridge, they didn't burn five other bridges. Uh, or they, they tried actually not to burn any bridges, right? So it was, even if it's slower, they went for that route. Um, I, I don't know how it is in India, but certainly uh, there is it globally, and particularly in America, there's this cancel culture, right? There's this, uh, this very reactionary uh, approach, uh, and, and that applies to all people who are, who are trying to break through the boundaries, which you can understand, because the boundaries are not serving them or others well. But I think the how we break the boundaries makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like, how do we go about that? And, and so to me, I think leading with nonviolence, leading with compassion, uh, making sure we're not creating more barriers uh, in the name of progress uh, feels to be uh, skillful. Um, but, you know, particularly in the Indian context, uh, how are you seeing that boundary dissolution? Because if that boundary dissolution ends up just changing the face of the problem, that's not progress, right? Like, so how do we make sure that we're not just changing the face of the problem? Agree. Okay. No, I, I, I agree with you. And I think, again, you will need both. See, I, I do think we live in kind of different times now. Uh, and, you know, while one can have endless arguments about what it could have been and what it should have been, I think there are times, for example, during Hitler's Germany, etc., where one cannot be sure where a completely nonviolent process would necessarily on its own work. Uh, I wonder whether you need, you know, both the, and I would not ever advocate violence, but the more aggressive, let's say, the uh, treaty othering of the enemy, so to say, uh, approach of a lot of activists uh, of saying that I decry you, I treat you as a bad person, and therefore the problem is we have to overcome you. and you know the more nonviolent and longer term approach of saying that i see you as yet another person just like me and like me there is good in you and there is bad in you and my fight is against the bad in you uh i think we might probably need a little bit of both uh and uh, you know so uh, sometimes you need that aggressive activist kind of thing to unsettle a person who is otherwise in power and completely uh, oblivious to anything else and believes that everything they're doing is right. Uh, so sometimes you know, you need to shake them out of that complacence and maybe a little bit of that uh, is useful. And once shaken, perhaps is a better time to engage them in the longer conversation of saying you and I are the same. I mean, there are behaviors in you that are wrong. There are behaviors in me that are wrong and let's sit together, build bridges and figure out how we can work together to overcome it. I think yeah. a little bit of both might just be needed. Yeah. Uh, no, and, and I, 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 I wish that it was possible completely to bring about change with, without any of the uh, aggression. Uh, but I mean, honest, hand on heart, I'm not sure whether it's possible. Uh, and maybe that's a defeatist thought in my mind. But, uh, but I do. Feel- well, I mean, th- there is actually a lot of data on how nonviolent uh, movements end up uh, succeeding over the longer term, and violent movements don't. And there's True. very exhaustive True. data. But on what that. is not available uh, is whether there has ever been a movement that was nonviolent in an atmosphere where nobody else was supporting them with violence. If you look yeah, at the Indian yeah, freedom so- struggle, so why we did have the nonviolence of Gandhi, we did also have the aggression of Subhash Chandra Bose and the aggression of Bhagat Singh and, you know, the yeah. mutiny and all of that kind of stuff. So we don't, we will never ever know with a certainty, mathematical certainty of any kind, whether we could have got that same independence only on Gandhian principles. And, yeah. And, and I mean, at, at that level, it's very hard uh, to even right. figure out where well, you have to find out where you stand and, and work in that way. Correct. Correct. Uh, but what I find amongst so, very so good I friends, know where I stand, Nipun, sorry. I stand very close to Gandhi. I, I cannot get into that aggression, etc., etc. mode. But what I've come to learn over the last few years is perhaps one need not be dismissive of them. 
and one can be respectful of that approach also one can say no that is not the approach i will believe in and follow but one can be sympathetic towards it yeah and and i think that's actually uh what gandhi would do as well right build bridges even just be, you know uh, right. just because you don't agree with people's methods gandhi did that even with people that tried to ass assassinate him uh but i think the challenge and it's actually a personal challenge with people who i actually even uh, there are many parts of them that i i admire uh that are working to push these boundaries uh perhaps with means that i personally am not called to uh adopt but uh i think the challenge is that whenever you have a spectrum and when you are moderate right when you're not like binary when you're not just this or that the challenge is we use is that like when when our anger gets high we instead of going on the side of nonviolence and compassion we we say oh no this is justified and and then you know when we should be doing the other we kind of you know we conveniently flip flop and i think I that's agree. the challenge um agree. and 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 in that sense you can end up justifying anything um you know and 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 so it's i i think this is sort of the systemic challenge but without breaking that down any further uh i want to ask you about um you know if you if you look at your journey uh it's very interesting for multiple reasons um you started at sony tv i don't know how many people know that um but you're very familiar with the corporate world uh e even pat after that then you did give india uh which is you know not the private sector but the public sector and working with so many people so many other nonprofits and then you did this danutsav uh which is uh i would say largely a voluntary sector um and so these are three uh is sort of the three major sectors and if you look at your arc over the last 30 years uh you you have of course uh done so many other things as well but if you look at that arc uh it's a very unique uh lens that you have of the private public and the voluntary sector can you share a little bit of uh let's say i'm a young kid and i'm looking and saying i want to create i want to alleviate some suffering in the world and i have some of my talents i want to do something should i you know is the private sector the lever that i want to uh kind of tweak is it the public sector where i have the greatest bang for the buck or is it uh the voluntary sector how how would you respond to uh holding those three sectors because they're very unique right all of them mm. ha ah, good question uh, and i'm not sure i know the answer i'm not even sure there is one answer for everybody right uh i i think it will vary depending on the circumstances of the individual the kind of talents they have the kind of impact or even if not impact the kind of work they would like to do uh so for example i mean if you are looking at uh farmers and in india agricultural farmers and you want to do something for example for them there are various things you could do one of those areas of course is increasing the ratio of the consumer price of crops to the farmer price of the crops so today typically if you or i buy a kilo of tomatoes for say 40 rupees a kilo in uh, a city the farmer probably gets between 2 and 10 rupees a kilo very often and uh, you know so if the problem you want to solve for is how can i increase that ratio from 4 is to 1 how can i bring it down to say 1.5 or 2 is to 1 where the farmer gets at least half the end consumer price or something like that perhaps the best solution for something like that is either the uh, private sector altogether so you build a business that will actually deliver that or the public sector where you create uh, you know fpcs as they call farmer producer cooperatives and uh, through that through a more organized thing with a structured business plan in place all of that stuff that's the best way to bring about that change right but there are things that cannot be done through organizational structures whether it's corporate or non profit uh, and i think for those you will often have to rely more on the voluntary sector uh, and what are those things i think for example behavioral change very yeah. very very difficult to do through organizational structures uh you know uh which is why danutsav has never been done as an organization there's no organization behind it 
the idea a very idea and similarly i think a lot of the work that uh, you do in the space of trying to improve increase the level of kindness in human beings you yeah. can't build an organization that is going who's going to try and create kindness it has to be a movement it has to be something that moves from person to person and grows on its own and so i think there's a lot of those that are much better done through the voluntary space uh so i think there'll be and there are other things like you know what are your own financial considerations in that whole thing a lot of those things also make a difference in terms of which path you choose to go down what i can say from my experience in all the three spaces is if you really want the purest of intent to be visible to you then it's obviously in the voluntary sector you will not get purity of intent either in the corporate sector and you will occasionally get a few people who have purity of intent everywhere but i'm saying as a larger in general the re- purity of intent is far 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 higher in the voluntary sector followed you know way behind by the public sector so the public sector does have some purity of intent but more often than not i've seen where that once you build an organization 90% of the times the organization becomes more important than the you know uh, the goal or the social change that was originally the purpose of the organization mm-hmm. so you see organizations beginning to build corpuses uh, you know worrying about their own sustainability a lot of other things which actually detract from the larger purpose of solving the social problem that you were out to uh, address necessarily and of course in business you know personal goals financial goals etc often tend to override even the uh, stated business objective so i think purity of intent wise the voluntary sector is really really the space to be in. but but impact wise because a lot of people will say you know like that famous ivan ilich quote the path you know the the what the road to heaven is paved with good intentions or road to hell is paved with good intentions Correct. um it, that there is that's this gap true. that's that i completely agree that's what i said when i said that depends a lot on what your intention is when you start out uh so i i for example i don't think a completely voluntary movement as yet in our society has the ability to help uh providing the kind of you know if i took that earlier example of improving the ratio of income for farmers from their uh, consumer price ratio uh, i think it will be much much more difficult to do that as a completely voluntary uh yeah it will be far easier to do that through a structured organization either in the part private or in the public sector well but i mean it's so i think what you're saying and and of course that makes sense that you use different sectors to solve different problems correct uh but the question and, and you're saying also that if you care about your purity of intent mm-hmm. um that you would go lean more towards the voluntary sector correct but but if you care e- also for creating external impact i can't believe i'm asking you impact questions but <laughs> <laughs> um but if you care for also manifesting that because there is a gap like we said even with intention translating into action um that and, and I'm not even talking theoretically now I'm asking you Venkat now at this age you have this experience right now let's say you have three options open in front of you right you have uh you, you have somebody saying here's a unlimited amount of money go create change here is all kinds of political power in the public sector that you can leverage to create policy and and have that ripple effect and you have the voluntary sector option uh which do you think for you personally uh which would you prioritize um in terms of uh you know having at least a cascading effect i mean granted that you may not be able to solve the farmer ratio problem right but if you're able to solve more upstream problems the farmers will also be taken care of uh so given that hierarchy of upstream solutions where do you where would you put your chips in your basket in which basket would you put them in so in that sense i have already put bulk of my chips in the voluntary sector so i have a small set of chips in the uh public sector i have no yeah. chips left in the private sector now uh whatsoever uh although maybe it might be a good idea in future to go back if i see a need to but but yeah i mean i you know i think at at a broad level the root cause of all problems is us as people right i mean all the problems in society are <laughs> our own behavioral manifestations we wouldn't have these problems i mean in one fell swoop if 
if you do 2x of thanos and if you just remove humanity from the earth most of the problems would cease to exist it's when we come that we bring the problems with us and therefore i think if you really want to do that complete root cause analysis i think the root cause is that you know we as human beings are not good people uh, or at least not as good as we should be or we have the potential to be that we can and yeah. so if you yes and therefore if you really are trying to solve a root cause problem that is the only root cause problem to solve how do we make better human beings out of all of ourselves and that cannot be done through the public or the private sector they are just I, not capable of doing that i i i love that answer i could not have predicted that 20 years after our materan drive that we would be <laughs> here but <laughs> I I agree. I mean I I I also I also see merit in the private sector and I see a lot of merit in the public sector to solve very concrete problems and especially if you have very quick feedback loops, right? If if somebody needs something built urgently, like I would choose the private sector levers. Yeah. Um but if you're you know if if you put all that on a canvas, uh the place where you want to intervene, at least and and for me I think I would go in the voluntary sector uh for the purity of intent but the reason why i would choose purity of intent is because i think there's a toxicity when you compromise intent there is a internal toxicity that gets created and we may not be able to map how that plays out into the world maybe we just have bad relationships with people around us but you know we're doing glorious work outside uh but i th- i think that ends up playing a pretty critical role mm-hmm. um and but- and so Yeah, go ahead. So, Nipun, but it's pretty much like taking Western medicine or allopathic medicine, as we call it today, right? It's known that every allopathic medicine has side effects. Yeah. But right now, when you know there are times where, for example, you know that an allopathic medicine treats a particular disease, and if you did not use it, there is a ninety-nine point nine nine percent chance that you will just die. And therefore, yeah. you will make those compromises. You will take that allopathic medicine. uh you have taken it i have taken it you've all taken that when you needed to and then once you were slightly better off you will go back to purifying your body uh, to detoxify it from yeah. that impurity that entered the system so i think there are times where you will have to and actually in all honesty this is making the private and public sector sound like there are some very bad things which they aren't necessarily uh, at all uh, I, my limited point is you know uh different strokes for different situations so depending on what for example i think if the goal is to pull billions of people out of poverty i i think you do definitely need the private sector i think there is a lot of value in encouraging entrepreneurship in encouraging wealth creation and you know uh, and doing it in a way that will help pull a lot of people out of uh poverty uh empowering people to do that and stuff like that and uh likewise for large scale impact for example you know when you looking at the covid crisis right now in uh, much smaller microcosm of the mumbai city uh, you know and you need equipment you need you know pp kits you need masks etc kind of stuff and you need them delivered quick uh, either you'd go the private sector but if you need the money and the government moves very slowly in generating money uh, through its processes then you need the social sector because that can move much more rapidly with much greater agility than the government and stuff like that so and that since it involves money having to flow cannot completely be done by the voluntary sector because then the risks yeah. are far too high yeah i mean in service space we often use this story of the five monks where you have uh, you know they're sitting down uh, meditating and all of a sudden by the river they see a baby uh in a basket being uh flowing along and so they help the baby and then they you know you you have a second monk that says uh and, and there's value to helping uh that child if you were that child you would hope that the monk would help you a second monk says you know I'm going to see why we're having a continuous flow of these babies and goes and says oh, I'm going to set up an orphanage a third monk says well why do they need an orphanage we need to have family planning and so set set that up a fourth one goes and says well you know why do we even need that family planning because we kind of need more political change but even that goes away right and and so then the question is what is the fifth monk going to do um and, and so you can uh, yeah you know you can endlessly debate if you whether you're the monk number 4 and monk number 1 um like should you be doing what the first monk did you can't just let that child go uh, of course you have to help 
Uh, but at the same time, should you be going upstream? And if you're going more upstream, what is that fifth monk going to do? And, and to me, I think this is where, like, where, where Gandhi writes in Hind Swaraj and his vision of a decentralized, distributed, resilient ecosystem. So he's trying to respond at the first monk level to the urgent needs all the way up second, third, fourth. But he's also holding that fifth monk possibility and that vision. Um, and in so many ways, I think we, we lack that now. And so I, I sort of want to pivot uh, to another area of expertise that you have around education, because a lot of this is, is the minds and the hearts of a generation. And education, in some sense, uh, is the field in which uh, those seeds can be planted. So I, you know, it, for those of you that don't know, Venkat uh, has started a school uh, called Eklavia. He started a curriculum-based uh, organization. I, I'm probably not describing it right, but it's called Educational Initiatives. Um, and he I also, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Venkat, one of your earliest inspirations was a couple of your classmates, um, you know, uh, being ha having to drop out of your school uh, because of, of poverty. Uh, and so there is this nature and nurture kind of a, a situation where you have nature uh, you can't control, like all the factors, uh, where you were born, um, what, even what kind of name you had, uh, you know, what year you were born in. Like there's a lot of data on how the kind of year, like if, you know, Steve Jobs and uh, I, who, uh, I think Bill Gates, uh, Bill Joy, all those guys were born in a cluster of a time when they were in college, like the IT boom happened. Um, and, and so all those things are nature. You can't control those. Uh, but yet you have to hold them in a way that allows uh, the nurture to be most skillful. Uh, an education system at its, you know, at its ideal uh, should be doing that, um, but it's it's not, and I think the pandemic is also dramatically uh, changing that conversation, uh, but also perhaps opening uh, avenues for dramatic changes as well. Uh, and so I, I know you you think a lot about this. You're immersed in this world, uh, but particularly from the India lens and education and planting these seeds. Uh, and the context of the pandemic, like where where do you where do you land with education right now, and the greatest opportunities there? Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, you know, there's two things, right? I mean, education of the heart and education of the mind, uh, or you know, one is building the attitudes, values, culture, and habits, and the other is, of course, the more technical skills, the math, the language, the you know, history or knowledge based systems. Uh, schools in India have historically never done much on the first set of things, the education of the heart. We've just been miserable failures in our education system uh, with few exceptions. So for example, the spiritual or missionary schools, uh, the Christian missionary schools, as well as the, you know, the Hindu missionary schools like the Chinmaya mission and stuff like that, DAV and some of those schools, they've tried to do a bit of that values building and stuff like that. But Otherwise, the large majority of Indian schools have not, uh, have just left the issue of building values and building ethos to the family. It's been a family's yeah. problem, not the school's problem. So schools have traditionally been focused more as skill building institutions whose core job is to teach you language, math, science, etc. And uh, so that's been their focus in any case in India. Uh, Right now, in the context of the pandemic, the biggest challenge we're facing is the digital divide because uh, everybody who can afford a device is able to go online and get some skill building happening through that process. And uh, the millions of kids out there who don't have access, close to 70% of kids going to government schools and low cost uh, schools do not have a smart device at home or an internet connection at home. And uh, you know, actually that's higher, more than 70%. And uh, close to 70% is actually the people who don't even have a normal phone access in their homes because it's, they usually have one phone at home, it's with the father or the mother and they're out in the field or wherever at work and therefore there's no device left at home. So, so there is a slight fear in some sections that if this drags on uh, for a long time, 
then it might start impacting and it will increase the divide between the people who have and the people who don't have in terms of the gaps in skills, etc. I think that's one of the worries. We are seeing a bunch of initiatives being started by different people. Uh, one of my friends, Osama Manzar, has just day before yesterday started an initiative to try and collect a million digital devices by donated by people to help reach them to kids in need. But the reality is a million is nothing in a country like India. We probably have 180 million kids who do not have these devices. So, uh, so that's going to be an issue. Uh, there is a bunch of other people, of course, who look at it and say, you know what, we are overestimating the importance of skills in our lives. And, you know, a year lost in a child's life is not going to make too much difference. Uh, I partly agree with those people that to some extent that is true. Uh, the reality is one year lost in a 60 year lifetime on average or 70 year is like nothing, right? It's 5% or not even 5%, it's 3% of your life or even less, 1% 1, 1 of your life, 1.5% of your life. Uh, it's not much lost, but the problem is when a kid comes back to school and meets another kid who is way ahead of him or her, how do you, so if you're using this one year to help build in that child the confidence that don't worry about what you're missing out. Uh, and if you're able to use this intervening time to help build the rest of what school doesn't do, build the character, build the confidence, build the spirit of the child, build that sense of curiosity, the sense of kindness, the sense of wanting to do good. I think if we could do that, then these children would be much better equipped to go back to school, even if they are behind in their academics. But unfortunately, I don't know whether we are doing even that. And uh, I mean, you you have so many ins in that sector. I mean, what where do you feel uh, is is the point of intervention there? Well, it, it's going to require a lot of people doing a lot of things. Of course, I think uh, you know. Uh, organizations like Teach for India, organizations like Kaivalya, etc., who have large scale reach into the education system will probably try and figure out institutional uh, solutions to some of these issues. We must keep in mind that even these apparently big organizations will reach only a few hundred thousand children at best. And, you know, we are talking of 280 million kids going to school in India and 200 out of those 280 not having access to these devices. So, uh, but so I actually don't know the answer to this problem. To be very honest, it's not a problem that I've been able to get my arms around or figure out what one can do. Uh, in our own small ways, we've been trying to do a bunch of things uh, in this space. Uh, you know, one of my uh, uh, fellow trustees, at, you know, this trust that I've set up, India Welfare Trust, Aarti. Uh, I don't know if you met her, Aarti Madhusudan. She lives in Chennai. Uh, incredible woman. Uh, one of the, she's done two things uh, during this disaster. First, she started a very simple initiative called Call and Connect. Uh, the ask was very simple. She reached out to women, said, "Are you willing to do three calls with a girl child who's mm -hmm. coming from an underprivileged background?" Right? It's an agendaless three calls. Just be a friend to them, because mm -hmm. we don't know what these kids are going through. We don't know what struggles they're coping with and just having an adult outside of home for them to talk to might be of use mm -hmm. and she signed up a thousand plus women in you know a month and got them to actually do these calls many of them more than 30 40 percent of them continue these calls even three months down the line uh, on a regular weekly kind of a basis and uh, we've seen a lot of messages coming back from both the calling uh, well to do people as well as from the children uh, sharing how important, how useful this conversation has been for all of them. Just just having somebody to talk to kind of thing. Uh, the second thing that again she did with a bunch of other volunteers together, both of these, all these ideas are worked purely in the voluntary sector, not in the public sector, right? Uh, was the simple concept of can we help kids learn English through a phone? So if you have even an ordinary phone, not a smartphone. Uh, best way to learn language is by talking, right? So can we get people who agree to say, spend half an hour or 45 minutes every day for 13 weeks, just talking to a child and helping them learn English because English is an extremely valuable skill in India. Mm -hmm. And again, she started this about three weeks ago. She's already got 1,200 
people who are actually doing these calls every day with a child or uh, somewhere talking to them in english for half an hour every day and helping them pick the language up uh which i think will bolster confidence for these children once they get back to school so they may not have done their math or science or whatever else but they will at least go back to school saying i have learned 200 words in english which i think is incredibly empowering yeah, yeah. and she's now of course trying to figure out how can we take this english teaching idea and expand it to uh, you know security guards auto drivers ola and uber drivers who've been out of job for a long period of time how do we uh, help these people pick up these language skills as well so on yeah. one thing that we are now trying to do which is kind of uh, you know a completely again in the voluntary sector but trying to build a framework around it is we are trying to create a 100% volunteer driven mentoring program uh, which is basically similar to the call and connect but it's a longer term thing so the idea is people sign up to mentor a child for a year uh, yeah. at least and it can be longer than that by doing a one hour weekly conversation with the child and uh, it's 100% so we already kick started yesterday two or three groups and uh, in the next 10 days i think we will see at least 10 groups of 25 to 30 volunteers uh, who are each engaging 25 to 30 children for a one year period uh, but what we have also tried to do is design this in such a way that it is completely volunteer run managed driven and maintained so each of these 20 pilots are being owned and championed by people who are themselves volunteers uh, they do not necessarily own or run organizations etc and the idea is to see these as you know kind of i mean you could call it amway or whatever but scalable in that sense so the idea is you now have these 20 people becoming mentors for a year but four or five months down the line some of those people might be willing to become leaders to create their own groups of 20 people yeah. and so then each 20 becomes 400 becomes 8000 and so on and the ideas can be used this to create a million strong completely volunteer driven movement in the next two or three years yeah no it's beautiful and actually if we had more time i would ping you on this idea of scale and uh like uh intervention based appro- uh, approach to change or a ripple effect based approach to change correct um and, but we have actually a lot of questions uh that i do want to get to uh if you have extra questions maybe uh venkat will post call also uh respond on some google doc or something so yeah. you're so nepun my email id is venkatk n at gmail.com so anybody who wants to write questions you are well, yeah. Yeah. okay there so you have it post um, a slide so if roy to somebody could at the closing slide just post my email id there for people to write to me we we have a way to email everyone after the call uh, since you're okay with it we'll do that yeah yeah please not 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 everyone is okay with it yes uh, but we have we have a, a few uh, questions um do you want me to just read them out uh, should i read out a, a three of them and then have you respond they're sort of related but sort of not um, no. or do you want to go one at a time no you can read them out i'll take notes and then Yeah. <laughs> There it is. Um so the first one is from uh Karan uh he, he says uh you know you say that organizations eventually tend to focus more on the sustenance of the organization itself instead of the goal of the organization. So mm-hmm. how does uh how do you keep a balance on that? Um uh, so that's that's a question. Uh we actually have a lot of them I we won't be able to get to all of them right now but like Venkat said we'll get to it afterwards. Um uh the second question is compassion is uh and by compassion I think this is Sonal she's saying uh compassion sometimes is perceived to be a weakness and this can be said uh of uh, of all kinds of different um you know virtues like giving yeah. uh she says sorry i'm just uh i have to refine it here compassion sometimes is perceived to be a weakness in the corporate world uh mm-hmm. and yeah, you're unable that you're unable to take tough decisions uh such right. as downsizing so how has venkat been able to balance the goal of maintaining his inner core mm-hmm. uh while achieving his outer goals um and so that's the second one and i'll leave you with one third one just to presence these voices in um it's that even for targeted changes like farmer price this is uh krishnan even for targeted changes like farmer price or alleviating poverty 
uh, example that Venkat quoted mm -hmm. that are not direct behavioral shifts. For these changes to actually succeed at scale, don't you think behavioral shifts are required to get there? And in such instances, it becomes a little hard to decide whether to take the voluntary path or the private or the public sector path. Are there examples of organizations that have taken a mixed path uh, that you have seen work? Good one. So, sorry, that's a that's yeah. a lot. Uh, you, I, I don't know how you'll do it quickly, yeah. but- uh, No, so uh, once again, Nipun, I think I'll be grateful if you can just forward me all the questions with the email IDs of the people who asked them. And, you know, I'm happy to respond to all of them and I will copy one of you on it. So you can post all the answers in public domain or whatever you think is the right way to do it. Uh, so current uh, sustenance versus goal, I actually think they're three distinct questions in slightly different ways, although they may be over. They are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a tough one, right? Uh, you know, how do you, uh, because I don't think it's completely wrong to worry about the sustenance of the organization. It shouldn't be that, uh, you know, because if you as an organization, I mean, let's look at ourselves as individuals. If we see ourselves as vehicles for, you know, depending on whether you're religious or not, uh, if you see yourself as an instrument to bring good into society, or if you see yourself as a vehicle for God to manifest its goodness on uh, the earth, whichever way you look at it, uh, we do have to take care of ourselves, right? Uh, we yeah. do have to make sure that we, the vehicle, is in good shape in order to deliver uh, what it wants to deliver, the goodness that we seek to deliver to people. So pretty much I think even organizations therefore have to do the same. They do need to ensure that the organization is in good shape. Because if it is not, then it will fail to deliver what it is trying to deliver. So I don't yeah. think per se organizations worrying about their own sustenance is bad. Uh, I think the challenge is, you know, the classic tail wags the dog problem, which is that the larger organizations become, uh, the more they tend to get more obsessed about their own sustenance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that is when it becomes a problem. Now, how do you strike the balance between the two? I think the best way to do it is through periodic deep inner reflections, uh, whether it is at the board level of the organization, at the level of the founder of an organization, the managing team, uh, the volunteers, various levels. Uh, if one can institute a culture of deep periodic reflection and just keep asking yourself that, that are we in our day-to-day -day actions and in our strategies and in our longer term work holding the goal higher than our organization? And yeah. then in ind individually, are we holding the organization higher than ourselves? Right? And I think if each of us can answer that to ourselves in honesty, uh, and it doesn't even have to be a group reflection, can be individual. I think we tend to be the most honest when we are reflecting alone. Uh, the moment there is a second person, your image perception, your ego start coming into play. So I think if you can build that culture of deep introspection and reflection, that itself is a good way to try and uh, handle that. Uh, of course, the bigger question is what is the starting motivation? So if an organization has been founded with the intent of say, making money or with the intent of you know, being successful. I, one of the reasons I prefer the voluntary sector and I, you know, you said this, I like my name to not be visible more and more. Uh, I actually think, find many instances where success hinders change. Uh, the greed to be successful makes you compromise on real impact or real change that you want to do. Uh, so you will see organizations after organizations that are more hungry for awards, for recognition, for credit. So you will have organizations claiming we impacted so many lives or we raised so many millions of dollars. And if you actually probe into the reality, you will find that a lot of those dollars were going to be donated anyway. It just, yeah. you were just the vehicle through which it got rooted, but you claim that you raised that many dollars or whatever it is, right? And I think you'll find many organizations going through this. So yeah. it's also a question of what was the original intent, because if the original intent itself wasn't pure, there's not much you can do to bring that balance because yeah. there was no intended balance in the first place. Yeah. Sorry, long answers. No, no, it, it's, uh, it, it, if, uh, are, are you able to stay uh, five, 10 minutes or do you have a hard I stop can, it? I, I can stay till about 10, five. 
you know, I have a hard stop. I have a recall. That no, I, I, otherwise, I was going to say that you can skip the other two questions, but maybe you can respond to them quickly since yeah, we present yeah, them yeah. because we have uh, some closing thing too. Sure. Yeah. No, so Sunil, uh, the question about, you know, I agree with you and not just in the corporate sector is compassion and a lot of positive values seen as weakness, but I also think in the political space today in India yes. and in many other parts of the world, that's exactly what is happening. Uh, yeah. If any of you has ever meant, uh, met, and I know this is a politically biased thing to say, but that is my personal political view. There is a gentleman called Harsh Mandar. If any of you has ever met him, you cannot meet a softer, milder, sweeter, and more compassionate human being than Harsh Mandar. He is right now being prosecuted in India for being anti-national and for provoking violence. I cannot understand this, right? So this is a problem that will happen everywhere. And I'm sorry if you do not agree or subscribe to his political views, that may be a different issue. I don't want to get into that, but this is the sweetest possible human being who's not capable of violence. I, to consider him as provoking violence is like, I just cannot understand, right? And so that happens. So that is, I think when people are scared of you, and this is what happened with Gandhi, right? Uh, that people did not understand his approach. And when you don't understand, it creates fear. Fear comes from the unknown, from the uncertainty. So a lot of times the corporate reaction to compassion is fear because they've never encountered it. So it's natural. We, we have to expect that it will happen. And the only way to do, to tackle that is to keep being compassionate. So we face this a lot of times in Dhanutra when we reach out to organizations, to corporates, to other people, to encourage them to celebrate. And, you know, when we talk to them and they say, okay, can you, you know, tell us how we can do it? And we give them a lot of ideas. And the first question is, okay, so why are you doing this? What's in it for you? Yeah. And we say, no, there's nothing in it. And they say, so then what do you want from us? And we say, nothing. We don't want anything from you. In fact, we are here to ask you whether there's anything you want from us. And if there's anything we can do to help you. And... For years, we found this now, the corporate struggle to understand this. They just cannot understand that somebody can come and meet you and say, I don't want anything, but is there something I can do to help you? Uh, but we just stuck with it. And I think people will start with distrust. But once they experience that your compassion came out of a genuinely good place over a period of time, they gradually, you are able to uh, win them. Uh, yeah. I think you need to wrap up, uh, right? So I'll hand over to you, <laughs> Krishna. I'll respond to your question on mail, and I'm happy to respond to everybody else's. Yeah, and, and, and we'll put up a Google Doc. Uh, there's also a bunch of questions, Venkat, around uh, the project you mentioned with Arti. Uh, people want to uh, yeah, yeah. participate. Uh, there's one question from America of how do we, you know, can you document so we can try to do that in other places? Yes, we have documented uh, already. Yes, we'll be happy to share. Uh, well, all of those kinds of things. We we will have a way to interact with everyone after the call as well. Uh, so we want to definitely keep the conversation going. Um, I want to ask you one last question. Uh, it's something to the tune of what I would ask you, but since Sridhar from Mumbai has asked this, I'll go with that. Uh, he says, what keeps you optimistic, especially in these times when so many hurricanes across uh, most aspects of human life are erupting? So... Um, you know, if you were to look at the larger landscape, so many problems, so many challenges, even compounded, uh, what is it that keeps you optimistic through these times? Uh, I think, you know, uh, this, the goodness that I've seen in so many people in the last three months, the uh, extraordinary acts of uh, kindness that people have displayed, the kindness and courage. Uh, I mean, whether it is just, you know, We've already spoken a lot about doctors, but, you know, Mumbai has this public bus transport system called BEST. And uh, for the last three months, nearly 20,000 of these drivers and conductors have been going out every day and doing their jobs. Uh, they have not said, I am at risk of contracting the disease, but I'm going to stay home. Or if you look at all the sanitation workers, all the public health workers, I mean, we've lost, I mean, while it's all nice to criticize government, we've had many government officials dying of COVID because they were out there in the line of duty. I think there's a large number of people out there who've shown enormous amounts of courage in doing what they have done. 
a lot of them have done it not because they needed the money but because they thought it was the right thing to do uh, and that's courage uh, and i think a lot of people are down it out of compassion and kindness i mean including volunteers including many of these people and i think as long as we can see that i get the confidence and the hope that if we can just focus on that and if we can find a way of helping that grow you know then together we shall overcome <laughs> beautiful um before we go um there's a bunch of uh, appreciative comments as well venkat uh, but uh, prior to it uh, you know that a bunch of your fans are also volunteers with service face and are volunteers here um so they did some fishing around and uh, we oh no 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 <laughs> <laughs> Can you do no, this after I'm gone? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just going to read one small thing. Okay. Uh, it's uh, I, I I think it's is just very emblematic of of who you are. Uh, this is from uh, Narayanan Bagul, uh, who of course was a Padma Bhushan awardee uh, in the banking and finance sector. Um, and uh, he wanted to leave Bank at a comment. Um, he's one of the many people tuned in. uh right now into this conversation um and here's what he says about venkat he says he looks ordinary but in fact he's an extraordinary individual devoted to and working for betterment of society he looks ordinary but he's a missionary who single-handedly created a movement for spreading of principles of philanthropy in the length and breadth of india he looks ordinary um but he is a sage who has transcended greed and works for a cause and not for applause he looks ordinary but he embodies all the virtues i aspired for but never could fully achieve in my life may he continue to be blessed and i think venkat uh we all uh even those who don't know you uh would certainly uh, double down on that last comment that may you continue to stay blessed um and keep creating ripples uh whichever monk you you feel called to do uh i'm sure it's going to create these wonderful ripples so thank you so much uh for uh you know this conversation uh for your friendship uh and most importantly uh for what you have facilitated for the world um so thank you uh and and I'll I'll give it to you for closing remarks here and then after that we'll do a minute of silence so sure. I know you have to go uh in 60 seconds but uh, uh yeah. but thank so, you no thanks thanks uh, nepun thanks for uh I am a little emotionally overwhelmed uh mr wagul is like god to me um uh, and uh, I'm deeply touched by his comments uh no grateful for the opportunity for this conversation i enjoyed every interaction with you uh it stimulates it provokes in different ways and i think that's that's really wonderful and uh, a big thanks to everybody out there who you know decided to spend an hour of their time listening to two friends just chat uh i hope it was of some use to you at least uh and thank you please keep doing the amazing stuff that each one of you does thank you we'll just do a minute of silence in the spirit of gratitude uh for all the forces that have uh, allowed for so many blessings to be created so just just uh, uh, maybe 60 seconds in silence here <laughs> 